two, okay, well, we're, we're not, um, Hitler is, okay. Um, so he begins to threaten Poland. I kind of talked about this yesterday when I talked about uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, agreement or the non-aggression pact between Russia and Germany. So uh, on this map over here, this beautiful map that I've drawn, Thank you. I think it's pretty good. I think it's good. Now, as well as the people that took the map quest test did or quiz, uh, I don't feel like I need to help have you help me label this because you can figure it all out. Okay. Uh, those of you that have not taken the map quiz, if you can make it to my classroom anytime uh, during the day, just swing in. I can give you the map quiz. You can come in before school. Uh, I have a meeting during house tomorrow, so that will not work. Yes. Feel like nobody. Is it right here, this blue one? Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, with this, guys, um, so on September 1st, 1939, okay, Hitler's going to invade Poland. And then, as I told you, two weeks later on the 17th, the Soviet Union is going to invade from the east. And because 90% of the Polish army is on the western front, the Russians are going to come in very rapidly. Now, on the third, Britain and France, as they said, if Germany was invaded, or excuse me, if Poland was attacked, they would get into war. They would go to war with Germany. And so, most historians use September 1st as the start of World War II. I like September 3rd because that's actually when Britain and France declared war. So, it's also easy to remember. 9-3-3-9. Started World War II. Okay. Um, within two weeks of the Soviet invasion, Poland is conquered. So just over a month to conquer a country this size is incredible. Okay. Uh, as I go on later today, we're going to see six countries fall over here. In a matter of nine weeks. And I'll remind you in World War One, when Germany invaded France, basically, guys, they fought over around 40 square miles for four years. France will fall in two weeks. So this type of warfare that the Germans are employing first in Poland and then in Western Europe, and later in Russia, has a name that some of you already know, which is what? Blitzkrieg, okay, or lightning warfare. So on this slide and on the next two slides, I have some photographs that will help me explain this to you, those of you that don't know what Blitzkrieg is or exactly how it worked, okay? Now, in the United States, after the invasion of Poland, um, Congress will debate ending its neutrality, and they will repeal the arms embargo in the United States. So not only will we sell you our planes and tanks and guns, we will sell you the bullets, the bombs, and the shells to go with them, okay, unlike 1937. Okay, so we're still not in the war, but we're going to help our allies. Now, the picture in the middle here shows a column of tanks. And to the left here, a column of motorcycle cars with sidecars on them. Now, each one of these motorcycles can carry three troops. The guy driving it, the one in the sidecar, and... A person can stand up behind the driver. Now, these German tanks, there are different models. Why does this keep turning off? I think it's dead. Sorry. I think Michael can replace the robot there. <laughs> Somebody just follow me around? Okay. Um. So, name some of the German tanks. The Panzer. 
the tiger. So you get the Panzer one, two, and three, and the Tiger one and two. Now, the fact is, these tanks are fast, and they have very good armor and very good firepower. Much better than the American counterpart, which is the what? The Sherman in World War II. Later. Yeah. We have Abrams today, too, and they're kind of good tanks. Okay. Um, now, if you got one on one, a Sherman tank versus a Panzer or Tiger tank, you're in trouble if you're in the Sherman. Now, if you got five Sherman tanks versus one German tank, you got a fighting chance. I think in the first battle we engaged, the Germans in the Battle of Kazarine Pass in North Africa, literally the shells coming out of our tanks were bouncing off the German tanks because of their army, okay? And they were destroying ours. So we had to make some improvements. And we mass produced the Sherman tank. So motor companies like Ford Motor and others converted from making automobiles to making tanks. And we made a lot of them, okay? But again, we're not in this thing yet. You over here, you have trucks that can move troops, okay? Armored personnel carriers that I'll have on the next slide, okay? This is a fast moving army. Now, from the air, this is a famous World War II dive bomber called the, the Stuka dive bomb. Now, this is an extremely menacing aircraft. So what dive bombers do, guys, is they come in on a steep dive and they actually point their nose at the target release their ordnance or their bombs, so they're very accurate. These are really good at taking out enemy tanks, enemy artillery. So when you have a fast-moving infantry that's moving along with the tanks and trucks and motorcycles, these bombers will clear the path by taking out enemy tanks and artillery. Okay, so these two things combined, along with others that I'm going to show you, will help the Germans unleash Blitzkrieg and overwhelm their enemies, okay? So, the next slide defines Blitzkrieg here, okay, or lightning warfare. Now, this is cognizant, this, you really are relying on air power here, okay? This is the Junkers 88, which is their heavy bomber. This is the Messerschmitt. They have different models of this, the 109, the 110, and so forth. Here's a good picture of the motorcycle troops, okay, armored, armored personnel carrier, and a German tank, okay? So these will, you can strike at the heart of the enemy. These planes, these bombers can go over rivers, mountain ranges, bodies of water, to attack at the heart of an enemy. Now, if you're doing this, if you're about to invade Poland, you're going to send these in first. What are you trying to take out? What's your, what's your first target that you're trying to target? Factories is a good one, but not first. Railroads might come second. Because that allows them to move troops from one place to another railroad. Okay. But airfields, A number one. Okay. If you can take out their aircraft, then you have air superiority. You have the upper hand, both literally and figuratively. You have the upper hand. Now, the Poles, they had an air force, but it was not as modern as the Germans. They're still flying biplanes. Their tanks pulled over from World War I for Poland. So the Poles are in trouble, no question. Okay. Now, the French, they have a better army than the Poles, much better. It won't matter. Most of these countries do not have air defense systems. So the only way to shoot down a 
plane. A bomber like this is with another plane. And if you take out their planes, then they control the skies. Now, the British will develop anti-aircraft fire from the ground. The Germans will definitely have it. Okay, so when we start turning the tide and start bombing Germany, they will be able to shoot at us from the ground. Okay. So, this is a uh, this is a World War II hand grenade. Have I passed this around? Okay, it weighs about three pounds. Now, if I could launch this into the air at 25,000 feet, and one of these bombers is flying up there, and this explodes in the air, the shards of metal coming out of this grenade are going to fly out at high rates of speed. And you can call that shrapnel, or you can call it flak, which is what they generally call in the air is flak. Okay? Now, instead of using a grenade, you use a shell about this long and about this wide. And you fire that 20,000 feet up in the air or 10,000 feet in the air, whatever altitude you think you're flying at, and it explodes, sending out flak. If that flak hits the engine of the plane, it brings down, helps bring down the plane. If that flak kills the, the pilot and the co-pilot, that are flying the plane, the plane comes down. You understand? Blows off the wings, the tail fin, all of these things. Okay. So our our flight crews later in the war will fly over eighty thousand bombing missions over Germany, and a lot of them will not survive because of this anti-aircraft fire. But the poles don't have it, so they're in trouble. Belgium doesn't have it. The Netherlands doesn't have it. Denmark, Norway, they don't have it. Okay. So, like, and I've just already talked about all this stuff. So let me come back here and let's look at these planes back. Sorry, I got your mug on there. So here's a, the Yunkers 88. This is the heavy bomber, the Stuka dive bomber, and then the Messerschmitt. These three are the Germans. Now, this bomber for the Germans is smaller than most World War II bombers, but they were able to mass produce this. They have thousands of these. Okay, now, all of these planes on here, um, if you're flying over 10,000 feet, you need an oxygen mask and probably a lot of warm clothing, maybe even a heated suit gloves and so forth because if you're ever flying in a commercial plane you take off and you hear ding it means you just hit 10,000 feet the air up there once you get above 10,000 feet it becomes difficult to breathe okay so that's why they have the oxygen masks on the plane this one right here on the bottom this is the only pressurized aircraft up there if you guys many of you know this is the b-29 these were made in wichita they did not go into service until 1944 this is what we use to drop the atomic bombs in Japan, B-29. Okay, you could fly in this in a t-shirt and shorts. These other planes are not so comfortable. Okay, so if you look at the size of the Yonkers 88 compared to, say, the B-17, which was one of our most common bombers, the B-25, the B-24, the British Lancaster, the Japanese bomber here, it's a smaller bomber. Okay. So it's a little bit more maneuverable. It's a little quicker. Okay, it's a good plane. All of the German planes are good. All right. So, what happens next? Now, one thing Hitler can do after he invades Poland is he could just keep going and attack Russia. But Britain and France have declared war on. Him. So if he invades Russia right now, first of all, it's October. It's too freaking cold. Okay. Second of all, he'd have to worry about his, his left flank. And so what Hitler's going to do over the next six months is move his troops back across Germany towards the Western Front. Now, he's got a new highway system to move those troops, doesn't he? And those guns, yes? Called the Autobahn. So over the next six months, guys, 
There's going to be no fighting in Europe. As Hitler gets ready to invade these countries. This time period is known as the phony war. Now, speaking of anti-aircraft guns. So I got that tank poster at the World War II Museum five years ago in New Orleans. New Orleans hosts the National World War II Museum. Okay. And so five years ago, when I met, met up with the fellas down there for our 50th birthday, okay, me and my buddy Van went to the museum. I got a bunch of pictures from the museum, and I bought that poster. Okay. Now, this, guys, is one of the most famous weapons of World War II. It's the German 88 Flak, Flak 37 80 millimeter dual purpose gun. Let me read this to you. When I walked in the museum and I saw this, I'm like, no way that they had one of these guns in the museum, okay? Because it's famous. I've been teaching about this for 20 plus years, and I'm like, holy cow. All right, so the 88 millimeter flat gun is one of the most famous guns of the war. Originally designed as an anti-aircraft gun because it could launch 20 pound projectiles 26,000 feet in the air and explode, okay? Its, fat, its flat trajectory, high muzzle velocity, and range of the gun also made it the best anti-tank gun of the war. Allied soldiers faced and feared this gun in every campaign in North Africa, the Mediterranean, and European theaters. It was responsible for a great number of casualties suffered um, by both tank and air crews. Of the 88mm gun, the late Stephen Ambrose, did anybody read a Stephen Ambrose book in here? Okay. Uh, said this of the 88s. Those 88s became a legend. It was said that, that more soldiers were converted to Christianity by the 88 than Peter and Paul combined. Because once these things started firing, you started praying. Okay. In the Battle of the Bulge, which is in the last month of the war in Europe, Last major battle of Europe. The largest battle in the European theater. <coughs> More than a million troops fighting it. It will take place in the Ardennes Forest in Belgium and Luxembourg. We will have 81,000 casualties. Most because of this gun. The Germans started firing these shells into the trees of the forest. And when the trees exploded, they sent out splinters at high rates of speed, which would enter human flesh at high rates of speed. Okay? These guns were brutal. Okay? Picture here of the um, one of the German motorcycles that they used. They were pretty good at that stuff. All right. So for six months, we got the phony war. From October to April 9th. Now, when April 9th comes, it's over. And Germany is at the border. France, Belgium, Netherlands, and Denmark. So first, he's going to invade Denmark. Now, the first time, I believe, in history, we're going to see the use of what's called paratroopers. Soldiers jumping out of airplanes with parachutes. The Germans will employ this in Denmark. Now, once the German tanks start rolling in, after they bomb, they do selective bombing in Denmark, they don't think Denmark's going to fight that much. And they don't. So all you had to do was just kind of show them. We mean business. We will destroy you. You need to surrender. And so they surrender. Okay. Now, in all of these countries, guys, there is resistance that will... We'll go. You guys have read books like Diary of Anne Frank. Okay. You know there's people in these countries that will resist the Nazis. They just, some of them will lose their lives. Some of them will survive the war. Okay. Now, so once Denmark goes down, Hitler's going to go after Norway. Now, you guys remember learning about the Battle of Troy? Like in the ancient times, the Battle of Troy? 
What was the famous thing about the Battle of Troy? The Trojan horse. So the Germans are going to use the Trojan horse to take Norway. So this map is pretty good for Norway. Everybody see this over here? Obviously, it's got a large uh, coastal area of the North Sea up here. Why did the Germans want Norway? Well, they can control the North Sea shipping lanes. And if they if they choose to, they can um, basically, you remember, anaconda type thing where you surround Britain and don't let any supplies in or out, okay, with your navy. So if you control the, these ports up here, you can do that more easily. And control airfields in Norway where you can send bombers to bomb Britain, okay? So what the, what the Germans do is they're going to sail cargo ships into Norwegian ports, posing as, you know, carrying goods, food, and other things, okay? They come in at dusk as the sun is starting to go down. They get into the ports, and inside those cargo ships are German troops, soldiers, and tanks. And so once the sun goes down, they come out of the ships and they take command control of the ports. Now, there will be resistance to this throughout the war. There's a pretty good movie called uh, Max Manus on Netflix. It's about, he's a leader of the resistance in Norway. And what he'll do is he'll sneak over to Britain and they'll supply him with TNT, explosives, and so forth. Then he'll sneak back into Norway, literally using canoes at night. He'll sneak up to the German ships, their Navy ships now, not cargo ships, their Navy ships, and attach explosives to them and blow them up. He did this for four years. He survived the war, Max Mann. It's a great story, okay, about resistance. All of Norway will not be subdued. Uh, the Germans don't want all of Norway. They just want to control the West Coast. Okay. All right. So, two down. One month later, it's going to be the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Now, guys, in World War I, the general for the Germans was Schieffen. General Schieffen. And the Germans invaded France. Through Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, what are referred to as the Low Countries. Okay. Well, history is going to repeat itself. Now, France has been preparing this for this for more than 20 years. So they have built up a line of defenses here called the Maginot Line. You heard of this? <laughs> yeah. The Maginot Line is 350 miles long. It's kind of cool, actually. Okay, this is a picture of more modern times. It's Most of it's built underground. They actually have a train, an underground train that runs can run troops up and down the line underground. It's kind of cool. And they have turrets that pop out of the ground, okay, to fire, you know, artillery to fire on uh, German tanks if necessary. The French... During the phony war, sat smugly, you know how the French are smug, smugly behind the Maginot line, thinking that there's nobody can break through this line. It's impregnable. Right? Okay. So, now, you see all these dots right here on this map? See that, Emily? See all these dots? What do you think those are? Not Germans. The Ardennes Forest. Okay, I know we live in Kansas. You don't know what a dense forest looks like. Guys, this is a dense forest. You cannot drive a tank through this forest. There's too many freaking trees. It's hilly. It's mountainous. There's rivers, streams that run through it. How are you going to drive a mechanized army through this forest? Well, again, I bring you German engineering. Okay, you send out the engineers. They clear a path. For your army through the forest. Okay, so the Germans are going to go through the Netherlands and Belgium into France, okay, through the Ardennes forest, across the Maginot Line. Now, 
when Poland was invaded and Britain declared war, the British started sending troops over to France. The French troops are all up and down this Maginot Line. Now, the Maginot Line does not extend to the Belgian border. They didn't build it up there. I don't know why, but that was stupid. Okay? So the British are here. Okay? The Germans start this invasion. When they start bombing Belgium, you're going to create a lot of refugees. Yes? People fleeing the war. Now, which way are those people going to flee from Belgium? Are they going to flee towards France or back towards Germany? They're going to go towards France. Now, I want you to, this is kind of a nasty tactic that the Germans use. They use these civilian refugees as a shield. So if you got a road, and there's not a bunch of roads that go into France from Belgium, but you got a road, and you got hundreds of thousands of refugees on the road, okay? And let's say a British tank is trying to come into Belgium, and you got all these refugees packed on the roads with their horses and their oxen and their carts and everything they can carry. They won't move because every time they got off the road on their way towards France, German fighter planes, their Messerschmitts, would come in and strafe them to push them back on the road. So when the, when the British try to get into Belgium and counterattack, these refugees won't move because they're afraid they're going to get shot at. And, oh, by the way, the Germans are hot on their tail anyway. The Germans are coming. They're moving fast. So the British, once they meet the Germans, are going to be overwhelmed. So this is what happens. They cut through the Maginot Line, cut to the coast, and then they fan out, take Paris. The French troops in here, the British troops in here, are all going to be pushed back to this small town on the coast of France called Dunkirk. How many of you guys saw that movie? Huh? Yes! Has anybody in here not seen any of the movies that I've mentioned? I thought I'd pick up quite a few with the sound of music. Is it like an actual movie or a play? What? Sound of music? It's a movie. It's a good one, man. I'd watch it again. I love long movies. Okay. So, France falls again in two weeks. Now, guys, as soon as Germany entered Poland, the British are like, all right, Chamberlain, nice job. You're done. He's out. They're going to replace Chamberlain. With this freaking guy. Is that a gun? Yeah, it's a Tommy gun. Uh, Churchill wrote a book on aliens. That's awesome. I own uh, some first edition Winston Churchill books. Okay. I'm a huge fan. Now, is he a perfect human being? No, he's not. Okay, Nobody is. You're right. But look at this guy. He's got on a pinstripe suit with a cigar hanging out of his mouth, a top hat, and a freaking Tommy gun. Like a gangster. Okay? It's a great picture. Now, can I give you a little biography on this guy? Okay, so when Churchill was young, just a couple years older than you, he was a journalist. And he went down to South Africa and Zimbabwe. There was a war going on down there called the Boer War. I don't know if you guys have studied that at any point. You know, there's a bunch of diamond mines and stuff down there. They got this big fight. Okay, Churchill gets captured. Okay, and he claims like he made this miraculous escape from captivity. He comes back to uh, Britain, and during World War One, 
Churchill is the Secretary of the Navy. And I don't know if you've studied the Battle of Gallipoli, which is a, a veritable disaster for the British in World War I. Well, Churchill gets kind of blamed for it. Okay, so later he runs for the parliament. Now, just like you have Republicans and Democrats, Democrats on the left, Republicans on the right, in the British Parliament, you have the Labour Party, uh, which is the left, and the Tory Party, or the Conservatives, on the right. Yes? So Churchill starts his political career as a Labour Party member. But nobody in the Labour Party really likes this guy. So he's what you call a backbencher. He sits in the back. The ones that are important sit in the front row. Okay? He's a backbencher. And nobody in the Labour Party likes him. He's obnoxious. Then he switches parties. And he joins the Conservative Party. And nobody in the Conservative Party likes him either. So he's a backbencher over there. But guys, you could hear his voice from the backbench, especially from 1933 on. And his number one topic that he liked to talk about in Parliament was to scream about Adolf Hitler. That this guy Hitler, when he came to power, he read freaking his book. He read Mein Kampf. He's like, listen, this dude is bad news. You better, we need to stand up to this guy. You better not appease him. And when Chamberlain was doing this Munich Pact and stuff, Churchill was his loudest critic. And so when the crap hit the fan, it turned to Churchill to run the government. Okay? And he will. He will lead. Guys, it would be very easy for the British to surrender, just like the French did. And there were a lot of people in Britain trying to get Churchill to surrender. He refused. He said these words. We will never surrender. We will fight on the beaches. We will fight on the landing grounds. We will fight in the hills and in the streets. We will fight in the air. We will never surrender. And then even if this island where a large part of it becomes subjugated by the Germans. Starving, we will continue the fight on the seas and on the ocean until in God, God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, comes forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. I've never done that. Yeah. I've played that speech a million times, so I know. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty close. Yeah, you can. Your speech can do that. You say bang on your phone. Who did this? Andy Fan. He was banging on the podium and stuff, too. What do you do that for? Speech. Speech class? Yeah. That's freaking awesome. Did he have notes? I didn't have any notes. Yeah, he printed it on a piece of paper. Yeah, I didn't do that. Okay, so this photograph. Guys, this photograph will be published in newspapers all over the world. And it's a frightening photograph to see Hitler standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. Now, when World War I ended, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the Germans signed their surrender in a railroad car. The French took that railroad car and made a monument in Paris with the garden around. It's a tourist attraction. So, when the French surrendered in 1940, Hitler made them sign their surrender in that railroad car, at that monument. And I'm telling you guys, Hitler was riding high. He just defeated six, country, six countries in nine weeks. Nobody's gonna stop him. So the fear is that he's gonna be taking a picture just like this in front of Big Ben, London Bridge in London. Or maybe in a year or two, a similar picture in front of the Statue of Liberty. Okay. Nobody's ever done this before, this quickly. 
Okay, so people are and should be afraid. Okay. All right, so you know what's more? Video Friday. Video Friday. Now, what you're going to watch, guys, is a 50 minute video over the Battle of Britain. You got five minutes? Let me set it up for you. Okay, so how many guys have seen this movie? You ready? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Narnia. I read that. Okay, you've read the book. So, it's a good movie. I like it. I'd watch it again. For sure. Hey, the very beginning of the movie, they show the bombs falling on London. Yes? And what do they do with all the kids? They ship them off to Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey? We got any Downton Abbey fans in here? Like the show? Yeah, the show. Me too. Hey, guys, the British do pro TV program programming better than they know. British, oh, British programming. British, what, like what? Downton Abbey. Uh, Masterpiece Theater. The British office is better. The British office is better. I got one for you. Look up this movie. The Full Monty. It's hilarious. Yes. They do comedy well, too. British are funny. Okay. Now, hey, 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 hey. So, three million children, when they attack Poland, the British start sending their, their children to the countryside. Now, remember the phony war. So for six months, you sent the kids away. Nothing is happening. Now, guys, in graduate school, I wrote more than one major paper on the Battle of Britain. So I've got, like, way too much knowledge in here to share with you. Okay, so the video is going to help take some of that. Okay, but the British uh, are going to be invaded from the air. Now, in order, because Churchill said, I'm not going to surrender. I want you to think about this, guys. If Britain falls in Churchill surrender, this is huge. This is so important to the rest of world history. If Britain falls, and one day the United States gets in this war and wants to liberate Europe from fascism, from Nazism, we would have to do so from across an ocean. If Britain survives, we have a launching pad 20 miles off the continent for all the troops, the tanks, the planes, the fuel, the medicine, ammunition, everything you need, 20 miles off the continent to liberate Europe. Britain has to survive. Churchill knows this. This is a historical moment. Okay? So, in order to invade Britain, the Germans are going to have to cross the sea, the English Channel, okay? Before he can do that, he needs air superiority. This is called Operation Sea Lion. Phase one, achieve air superiority over the English Channel and southern England. If they can do that, they can launch an amphibious invasion. They won't do that. They will never achieve air superiority over the English Channel. Why? Let me give you another quote from Churchill. Never in the course of human conflict, never in the course of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few. Those few are the pilots of the Royal Air Force. Some of the, most of those pilots were British. Some of those pilots were American civilians. Some of those pilots were Polish. Some of those pilots were Czech. But those pilots defeated the Luftwaffe in the air, not allowing Hitler to invade England. So when Hitler decides to finally invade Russia, his left flank is still open. 
First of all, we got to save the British troops that are on Dunkirk. We'll do that on Monday, okay? And then take you through the battle break. You'll see the video tomorrow. Two points if you can stay awake. I think it's pretty good. I've kind of viewed it. I looked at different videos. This one looks pretty good, okay? Lots of action, okay? Bring something to drink or eat. Keep yourself awake, okay? Good? Good? Okay, so. Good? Mr. Rep, can I run a 